Hey everybody, it's Scott Carson, the CEO and founder of Powered by MRP. Super excited today to have Dr. Russo on MedTech Marketplace. Many of you know Dr. Russo in the Northeast. He's a well-known, well-regarded plastic surgeon, Harvard trained, and uh, done amazing things over the last 30 years in aesthetics and uh, plastic surgery. But over the last several years, he's been on a mission to do some remarkable things to really elevate this industry. And like me, he's incredibly passionate about changing the industry. And if you're a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a PA, a physician, and you're in aesthetics and you want to go to the next level, you're thinking about leaving kind of the third-party reimbursement gerbil wheel that you're miserable about, and you want to kind of elevate your game and be a part of this radical, incredible 20, 30 years that's going to happen in aesthetics with all of these inflection market indicators coming together from youth to Gen Z and baby boomers and lots of access to capital and great technology advances. If you want to be a part of that, you need to know Dr. Russo. You need to be a part of what he's changing. And I really invite you to listen to the next 30 to 45 minutes because I think it'll be very advantageous to what you want to do. Dr. Russo, thrilled to have you on today and looking forward to dive deep into what you're up to. Thanks so much, Scott. That was a, an amazing introduction. And I really appreciate the time you're spending because I think this is critically important for anyone who is interested in getting an education in aesthetics because, you know, without that, we have nothing. And so there's a huge void that we need to fill with education because there's so many new patients, new injectors, new technologies that are coming into the industry. If we don't do this, if we don't do it right, we're going to lose it. So that's why I'm here today to talk to you and to talk to the listeners about just how to solve this huge problem about the lack of education in this space. Greg, let's dive right in. Love for you to kind of just introduce us to what you guys are doing from an educational and training standpoint. You know, we started out a long time ago before any of the things we use commonly every day were around. I mean, when we first started in aesthetics, the only thing I could really offer patients as a surgeon was two things, surgery or no surgery. That was pretty much it. We didn't have neurotoxins. We didn't have fillers. We didn't have radio frequency, ultrasound laser. We really had none of this stuff. So it was kind of like, in some ways you might call it the dark ages of plastic surgery. And in fact, most of the people who performed aesthetic surgery were sort of looked down upon by the rest of the field, right? Oh, those guys just do breast dogs and suck fat out. You know, really not real doctors, not real surgeons. Well, you know, in the past 30 years, it's really kind of completely flipped on its head. And now everybody wants into aesthetics. Nobody wants to do traditional reconstructive stuff anymore. And that's fine and wonderful, except, you know, right now we're at a point, and I'm sure you, you'll understand this, the, the number of people seeking these treatments, the number of new providers trying to get into this field, the number of new technologies that enter the field every day, tremendous numbers. The education is not keeping up with that, right? So you've got all these patients, new people who are trying to be injectors, trying to integrate new technologies, and they really don't know what to do because there is really no central location for education. So, you know, if you want to be a doctor or a nurse, you go to nursing school, medical school, there's a very defined curriculum. You have to pass board exam. You know, there's a very structured criteria and very clear endpoints. And then you go practice. This is the opposite. This is like, okay, how do I find out how to do these injections? Well, I'll watch someone on YouTube. I'll watch an Instagram video. I'll do this. I'll do that. And it's really created a quite dangerous situation for us because most of the people doing these trainings are really out for Instagram or whatever followers. They're out for themselves. They don't really care about teaching stuff. And most of the stuff they teach, frankly, it's just not correct. And as a result of that, patients are being injured, right? You know, when you start getting people who are poorly trained, don't understand the anatomy, they start just sticking needles in people and injecting gels or whatever, we have complications. And unfortunately, when you have complications and they get reported to the local board of registration in nursing, medicine, DPH, cosmetology, one of those boards, these are complaint-based boards that are legally obligated to conduct an investigation when a, when a report is filed against you. Yes. And unfortunately, when this happens, these people come at you with the, the intent or the idea that we're saving the world from these terrible you know, practitioners who are trying to hurt patients. And it's clearly quite the opposite. But nevertheless, if they get enough of these complaints, they start trying to shut down nurses or NPs or someone from doing these procedures, and it threatens the whole industry. So one question I just want to ask is, yeah, I, I want your opinion on it because I want to kind of set the foundation up of, of giving kind of the community that's going to be watching, listening to this 
kind of some information that could be helpful is the first thing you touched on is the incredible demand that is happening in this industry. And I think it's important to, for everybody to understand where that's coming from. And I'll throw a couple of points out there. And then I'd like you to, to share some of your insight where you think this is coming from. So one of the things that we know is, and I'll use, I'll two, use two bookends to kind of start this part of the conversation. One of them is, is few people know this, but one seventh of the world's wealth now exists in the US in baby boomers. One seventh of the world's wealth is concentrated in baby boomers in the US. So you got one point. The other thing I love to talk about this and people find it quite kind of intriguing when I bring it up because it's, it's an important point. If you look at the male makeup market, and I may have touched on this in previous phone calls, in the under 25 year olds, it is exploding, exploding. Now that may seem like, well, why does that matter to aesthetics? Well, if males, which are typically not quick adopters to aesthetics, are at 25 and younger starting to wear makeup, what do you think they're gonna be doing at 30? So as kind of technology guys and data scientists, we kind of look at these trends and we say, okay, wait a sec, there's a weird thing happening. You've got a massive market inflection coming in on the younger. You've got this incredible wealth where people really want to live forever. And uh, that's really going to drive incredible demand in this space like we've never seen before. Do you agree with those things? And also, what else do you see that's driving some of that demand? hundred percent agree with you. I, I, I like to talk about the old days and the new days. You know, when we first started out, people got old and tried to look young. And that's a really hard thing to do because mm -hmm. we didn't have the technologies that we do now. We, you know, basically we were just pulling people's skin and doing things to make them look tight. And we didn't understand aging. We didn't understand what created aging. And now with the advent of social media and people doing selfies and being on videos like this all the time and looking at themselves up close, we know that when you're on a social media site, it magnif when you do a selfie, it magnifies whatever quote unquote deformities that you have. So now, people like my kids who are in their 20s and 30s have already been doing Botox for five or 10 years. You know, people, if they see a slight imperfection, they've got to get the selfie or, you know, sort of angle just right so they don't see that. If they think their nose is a little bigger, their chin's a little too small, it, it affects the way they feel about themselves. So social media has driven people to us. Mm -hmm. But now these current generations are not about getting old and trying to look young. They're all about never getting old. So, you know, our, one of our biggest groups of con consumers are these younger generation people, like people in their 20s and 30s who are refusing to get old and they're just constantly doing things to stay looking youthful. So that whole group you're talking about is are becoming the hugest consumers of our services because they want to stay looking young. And actually, we now have the technology, non-invasive technologies, you know, laser, radio frequency, ultrasound, plasma, all these sorts of things, microneedling, microneedling RF where we can actually start treating them at a young age and they get tremendous results because they don't need very much, right? And now those people are gonna become consumers as you were pointing out for these services their whole lives. So I think that's a big part of it. But the, on the other hand, at the same time, the like Allergan, who's kind of one of the giants in the industry right now, estimates that will be 160,000 injectors short of what we need to keep up with demand Holy within God. the next couple of years. And when they say injectors, I don't know if they mean good injectors or just anybody who can you know, stick, some, stick you with a needle. But what I'm trying to point out is there's going to be a tremendous demand that's not going to be met by the current, the current mechanism we have for supplying providers. So we have just a massive amount of patient kind of engagement that we've no, never had from all different sectors. You really brought up one that I hadn't thought about. It really isn't the, the youth, but this kind of generation Z that... Uh, yeah. Uh, is a little bit older and, and uh, starting to get into some uh, some resources, financial resources, highly educated, highly informed, highly social enabled. They have an online persona. They want to maintain that persona and they're going to be looking to uh, to maintain youth. And, and that that's something I hadn't yeah. considered. Yeah. You know, getting back to to this issue about safety, which is really what I think you're, you're uh, touching on. Getting back to this issue, which I really think is centered around, you touched on it, safety, patient safety is really what we care about, is several weeks ago, I spoke in London at an intersection of kind of med tech and investment banking. And I had a number of panelists on the, on the discussion with me, and we were talking about how regulatory is very slow to, to catch up to change. And it sounds to me, we were talking about all these regulatory boards that get notified of things, and it's really at that point too late. So it sounds like one of the things you're trying to do is take your 30 years of experience, 
with your colleagues and start to get ahead of regulatory change and get these educational platforms in place on a macro basis domestically where you can start to train people to make sure we have safe outcomes. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, oh, we've trained probably about 5,000 people over the past 15 years. Our, con- our techniques have constantly evolved. And you really, we're all about safety and compliance because I think, as you pointed out in your opening moment, a lot of these procedures are being done illegally because anytime a nurse treats a patient without an order, we know they're practicing medicine without a license and they are, you know, there's no leg for them to stand on in a court of law. So we have created a, a cloud based EHR that's proprietary that allows nurses to get orders real time from a dashboard NPs so that they, they can have an order, they can you know, provide a compliant procedure for the patient. And we have created a system of learning mostly with on-demand videos, but really the way clinicians really learn is with hands-on, right? So the current model is that, Scott, if you wanted to come over and you know take and learn a course and you know, neurotoxins, fillers, whatever it was, you'd be required to, to find one of your friends or somebody who's a model for you take them to this course and you would inject your friend. Maybe you do the, his, his or her whole face. Maybe you do half a face. Maybe you couldn't find a model and you just watch someone else train. And that would be the model. That would be the learning. So like, tell me anything in the world that you can do and just watching someone do it once or even just doing it once, then feeling good enough to go and actually you know perform that procedure on someone else. I mean, there just aren't many of them and this definitely isn't one of them. So our model has been, okay, you can do all this on-demand training. You can take these exams online. You can do all the didactic stuff. But when the the rubber hits the road, when you actually stick the needle in the patient in our courses, we guarantee that you'll inject at least 10 people over the course of two days. They were very intensive courses and they're designed by me and they keep evolving so that we really do create the techniques that allow you to become a safe, compliant provider quickly and easily build confidence. And, you know, as again, again, when you actually have injected 10 patients, you might be pretty close to being competent and confident enough to do it success- successfully. But when you go somewhere and do it once and then never see that person again, and, you know, go to another course and treat another half of a face and another half of a face, I mean, that's the current status of learning. I mean, we, ha- we basically are like a college, like a university where you come in and you take the first level course, the second level course, that's a prerequisite for the third level course. You have to get signed off to get to the next level. I mean, it's very rigorous, but you know, we, we, we expect that we want something rigorous because, you know, we want to separate the wheat from the shaft. You know, we want to get people who are good providers to stay in it and people who just aren't able to do it, shouldn't do it. Right. Yeah. You got a couple of questions right out of the gate is yeah. you, you bring up something that's, that I hadn't really thought about. And I think it's really important for people that, it, it, that are going to watch this and as we kind of get it defined what this conversation is about and, and that get it out to the marketplace so people understand how important the information is we're talking about. Is, can you imagine if um, you said, hey, Scott, I, I'm a pilot. I'm going to show you how to fly a plane. And by the way, we're going to go, do, you know, you're just going to go and try it. And we're going to put passengers in the back of it. That's ridiculous. How about a, how about a dragster, you know, a 300 you know, mile an hour dragster? Just because I, I have a driver's license doesn't right. mean I can get in a missile. It's just in when you when you described it that way, it really just it resonated with me is, you know, I have a tendency to to because I'm in the space and this is my only skin and my only face. I'm highly careful of and, and restrictive to what I allow people to do on me because I've seen all the adverse events and how catastrophic it is to people's lives and the people that did the procedures when things end up poorly. So I very much want to be with somebody who's an F-14 fighter pilot. I want want to be, you know, that's who I want to be in the cockpit with. So that makes sense to me. You know, one of the things that that I want to just clarify is, is, is your educational platform limited to injections or is there multiple kind of educational portals that you provide beyond injections? Yeah, it's the latter. It's everything, right? So the the introductory courses are the neurotoxin and the filler courses, followed by kind of a cadaver course where we actually dissect the cadaver and really learn anatomy. Because I think that you're only as good an injector as you are an anatomist, right? If you don't understand anatomy, you really shouldn't be injecting in that area. If you don't know what to avoid in that area, you shouldn't be there. Um, Thirdly, we then then do you know some assessment courses, but we do PRP, we do Kybella, we do laser treatments, we do radio frequency treatments, you know, we do the full gamut of aesthetic medicine. 
right? We, we have whatever you want to get trained in, we can train you in that. So, we, so we'll do one-on-ones, we'll come to your office, but you know, our main headquarters, we're called Aesthetic Mentor. We're in Waltham, Massachusetts and Glastonbury, Connecticut. And uh, we're looking to expand beyond that. We're probably going to have a national show in Las Vegas, which I would like you to be at a year from this, this December. So you're a little over a year from now. Yeah. So we, we offer the full level of training with whatever you want to learn, because as I said, we have all the technologies and all the devices and all the products. Do you guys, this is kind of a clarification. It may, it may, I may be kind of misunderstanding or misinterpreting it, but it sounds to me that you're taking people that already have a driver's license and they already know how to drive, but you're teaching them specialty driving techniques. Maybe that's an kind of a poor analogy, but what I'm trying to get at, you're not taking just somebody off the street and saying, okay, we're going to teach you, you know, basic injections and anatomy and take you on. You're taking clinicians. Yeah. Yeah. These these are licensed practitioners. Yes. These are licensed. These are RNs, MDs, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants primarily, but I would say 85, 80, 85% of, of our trainees are RNs. And so the RNs need, you know, some supervision. There are more and more are, there are more, more and more NPs are becoming part of this because they can practice independently. More and more physicians are leaving traditional medical practices because they just can't survive there anymore, or they're at, or they want to add a med spot to their practice and they don't know anything about it. So they come to us and we, we can help them do that. A lot of RNs are going to nursing school just to do aesthetics, right? But if they let it be known during nursing school that they're interested in doing this, they get kind of blackballed. And they get treated terribly by the old nurses who just hate this. A lot of those RNs then go to NP school to be able to practice someone independently. And they're, they, But unfortunately, there's no aesthetic track as an RN. There's no aesthetic track as an NP. So they have to do you know, pediatrics or psychiatry or general medicine spending two years of their lives doing something they have no interest in just to be able to go into aesthetics. So I've approached several of these schools and said, hey, look, like, let's face it, like, this is going to happen. Why don't you be part of the solution rather than trying to stamp this out? And if you become the first school to do this, you'll have so many nurses, so many nurse practitioners trying to, you know, become part of your curriculum, they'll have to shut it down. So we have actually established that we're about to sign a contract with one of the schools of nursing in Boston, which I think is a huge breakthrough, because imagine you could actually go to nursing school and actually get trained in aesthetics and come to aesthetic mentor. You know, we have all the setup. We have a huge, we have a model base of 5,000. We have a, something called our model lab. We have 5,000 emails on, on, on record. We can sort of send out an email blast saying, hey, we're having a neurotoxin course. We need 55 models. The models will show up. They'll all be scheduled. The nurses walk in, the, the patients are waiting for them. I mean, it's like a machine, right? But it's taken us 15 years to get here, but we're here. So we can offer this rich clinical experience, but imagine if that kind of thing became part of a nursing school curriculum. That would really go a long way towards solving the problem. And we think we've taken the first step. There is no question. You bring up something really interesting, and and I, until you described it, I did it didn't connect with me. But our nurse, who's our clinical trainer on site, we've we've as I shared with you, we built our first ever first ever we think, which is a kind of a virtual training platform here, where all day long we're doing touch up training education with our customers with an RN on site through Google Hangouts, the same video service we're on. And so, for example, we can demo equipment, we can do side-by-side demos. Somebody says, hey, I got a patient in today, I haven't seen this skin condition, I have this particular laser, can you help me with this you know, particular application? We go side-by-side with that device, because we have a thousand devices here, and we can show them how to do that procedure and get ready for that patient or help them side-by-side with the patient. That, that and our nurse that's doing that education, she, she was actually an esthetician, and got so frustrated with her kind of lack of knowledge, she yeah. did just what you're describing. Went and became a nurse, graduated top of her class, hated every bit of the stuff she had to learn, but she still graduated top of her class. And then the day she came out, she went right into aesthetics. Yeah, she just thrived, you know, for yeah. six seven years. And then we we pulled her out of that uh, the industry and said, hey, come come work with us. But you're right, they have no interest in doing any of that. But no. the path to get to where they want to go is through this old established environment. Right now, the same thing applies to your nurses. The day she got out of nursing school, she probably looked around and goes, okay, so now where do I go to get education yes. in aesthetics? And she probably flew around all over the country, taking a course here, a course there. Some were good, some were bad, some were in between, 
but there's no cohesivity. There's no consistent educational stream. There's no one person at the top, you know, there's no curriculum to follow. It's catch as catch can, right? And if you're the kind of person, probably like your nurse, who's very driven and dedicated, you'll, you'll get that education. It may not be perfect, but you'll, you'll go, it's out there. Most people never make it in this industry, Scott. You know, most of these nurses come out and they try. And, and not only is the education a problem, What's even a bigger challenge for them is like, okay, you know, when people come in to train with us, I, you know, I say to them, listen, the easiest part of your day today is going to be me training you how to inject neurotoxins. That's going to be easy for me. And you'll probably pick it up pretty easily too. The hardest part for you is going to be to take that skill set that we've given you and make that into a business. Mm -hmm. That's almost impossible. I mean, that's really the big speed bump, right? So we've integrated courses into our school about, you know, business development, you know, how to, how to figure out ROI how to hire people, how to find, you know, just, we've hired people across the spectrum who are, who have been business people in the industry to come and work with us and create videos, train people. So we understand that you have to have a business component as well as the clinical education component. That's why we figure like, you know, we're just trying to offer everything because without these kinds of things, the chance of success is really, really small. And I hate to say it, but I have to be honest about it. I, I have again. I'm I'm really putting some dots together in this in this conversation because what I've noticed is what what ends up happening is these nurses either have left the traditional nursing industries and coming into aesthetics or uh, like uh, R and they they came out of school and they went right into it. They seem to bounce around to yeah. clinician offices where yeah. they think they're going to get the mentorship and the education. And everyone leaves, both the clinician and the nurse, leave very disappointed yeah. because the clinician typically doesn't know. They expect the nurse to know. That's the right. nurse doesn't know. And That's it creates right. this massive conflict. And then on top of that, they really have a limited level of, you just said, business acumen. Yeah. And so they, you know, they, they don't understand that profit isn't revenue and revenue isn't profit. Those are distinctly different things. And there's a lot of tension that exists. So you're right. I think this path you've created of creating an advanced level of education for them to get into, which is very hands-on and then giving them some, some tools of business yeah. that, you know, so they understand what EBITDA is and yeah. how it matters and what, what is a component of EBITDA and how that's going to affect their success. I can see now why your schools trained 5,000 and why you're so interested in really promoting this on such a high level. I'm going to throw one more thing and one more sort of monkey wrench into the wheel. Even in spite of everything I've told you, even if they come through our courses and do all the business stuff and do all these things, the chance of success is really still not great mm -hmm. because what people in this industry really need is ongoing support because no matter how well you're trained, no matter how much time and effort you put into it, and you might, like your nurse, know everything about that field. You still have to practice. You still have to get that clinical experience. And, I, and my personal feeling is it takes someone at least three to five years to become a really, what I call ninja nurses, like people who are just like so good at what they do that I would let them inject me or my wife or anybody, right? People that we choose, we take them out of class, we make them instructors, we make them supervisors, we make them managers, you know, we bring them up the ladder because we recognize how special they are. They're really, really rare, like hen's teeth. But in order to promote this educational sort of atmosphere, we have a network called Medical Aesthetic Associates, MAA. One, the one that's connected to Connecticut and one that's connected to Massachusetts. So after they go through the courses, if they've shown proficiency and they have the right sort of temperament and attitude, we bring them into this network called MAA, Medical Aesthetic Associates, which is like, it's like it's like a one large practice with many locations with ongoing mentorship. So, for example, we had Allergan come in yesterday and sit down and talk about the rheology of fillers, like the differences between fillers and how to use ones where versus other places. We have a medical science liaison from some of the companies come in talking about complications, talking about how the face actually ages. We have roundtable discussions where we have leaders in the field come in and talk about like, hey, how do you inject Botox? Hey, what device do you like for skin tightening? Hey, you know, which laser do you think is best for pigment removal? All these kinds of things. But what really separates us from everyone else is where we have that compliant network that I talked about where everybody in the network 
has the ability to get real-time orders via a dashboard, a clinical dashboard of nurse practitioners. So if an individual nurse, like your nurse who just got trained in nursing school, comes out and says, hey, I'm nervous about treating my first patient. I, I know I, I should do it, but I'm just nervous. They do the assessment of the patient. They send all that information up to the cloud. And there's a dashboard nurse practitioner sitting there going, hey, Jane, you know, I think that's the wrong dose of neurotoxin. Hey, you know what? I think that's the wrong filler for the lip. You know, I can't write an order for that. So there's another mentoring moment to prevent that nurse from making a mistake. Because honestly, if you have a significant problem or issue early on in your training, your confidence is shattered, you're shattered and you're likely not to continue in the industry. It just, I've seen it too many times. People really get shaken by it. So this nurse practitioner will say, you know, I think you should try this, try this, try that. They can FaceTime, it's all real time. That they do the treatment, the nurse writes the order, and it's all compliant and it's all fine. And that allows them to grow. So that compliant piece is there. And I'm always at the other end of that sort of string. So if the nurse practitioner has a problem, if they have a complication, if they have an occlusion, they run it all by me and I help help them manage it. And so it allows us to have group buying purchases. It allows us to partner with companies like yours for medical equipment because we have, you know, a couple hundred members right now. So we might say, hey, you know, we have a couple hundred, hundred members who are interested in hearing about your microneedling device, or whatever, whatever it is you're selling. So it, it gives us the advantage of always, always having, we have Facebook groups, you know, so they're always saying, hey, I have this patient. And this is what happened. What should I do? Or what would you do in this case? You know, so that to me is probably even more important than everything that went before it because you can train anyone to do anything, but really to mature them into a, an excellent injector takes you know, you sort of feedback from your peers, feedback from, you know, people who are a little bit be better than you, people that you start mentoring. So it's all about the educational piece. Got it. So let me see if I can just tie this together a little bit. So 80, 85% of your uh, students are nurses or NPs uh, or PAs, somewhere in that category. The rest are made up of clinicians, maybe some administrators in there, depending on the level of the, what they're getting. But I, I got, I got a group. Yeah. I got, they're coming through, they're really getting advanced level technique training on based on what they're interested in. Some may get all, some may get a little bit, depending on what they have interest. They, a lot of really focused on that anatomy because you can't be good. I've, I've grasped this and I agree with you. I surely wouldn't want anybody injecting me or treating me that didn't have a firm understanding of what's under the skin, yeah. not just the skin is. Yeah. And I get that. I understand that. And then once that's done, after you move on from cadavers, you're now working on hands-on or hands-on beforehand, then they graduate from this and then you've got this MMA. So you've basically got nurses and, and physicians on top of nurses and MPs and PAs. Yes. And as they're out there in the industry and they're running into situations, they send their information in real time yes. and they get guidance, basically get the approval to proceed, which gives them two things. One, several things confidence they're moving in the right direction. Yeah. A second set of eyes to make sure they're moving in the right direction gives them compliance, which is yes. severe lacking in the industry, it gives them basically sleep well, that they're moving in the right direction. And, uh, uh, and if things somehow there's an adverse event, it, unfortunately, if that occurs, they have some level of protection. They did everything they could from an educational standpoint to also a peer peer to peer review standpoint from an educational standpoint to make sure that patient safety is number one ahead of outcomes. Do, do I, I got that? 100% right. And they know they have ultimately a plastic surgeon or someone you know, close to that level that can help them. You know, like if there's really a problem, we come in and they bring the patient to my office or whatever. So they've got all those levels of support behind them as well. Got it. Okay. So I want to go back to something you said that I have, a, you touched on several things I really want to highlight that I think are interesting. One is, is you talked about the, the lack of success in this industry. And I want to point something out that I found over the years that has really been kind of a, a fascinating thing is medicine. If you're a physician, you effectively, and I'm not talking about plastics because essentially they've always been private pay for the most part. There is some third party reimbursement, but pretty much everything in aesthetic or everything outside of aesthetics has been third party reimbursed. And effectively, the clinicians have a monopoly because they they can basically run their business inefficiently, incorrectly, poorly in every possible way, and they still get paid. It's like the only business in the world where you could do everything wrong and still get paid. I mean, if you ran a McDonald's like that, you go out of business. If you ran an airline like that, you go out of business. You run my business like that, your business, if you didn't care about reviews, you didn't care 
but you still got paid. It, it, it's a remarkable. And then they make this leap into aesthetics and they don't understand it's a hundred percent experience. It's yeah. all on your reputation, your reviews, your feedback. And they, they can't quite understand why it's not working. And it's because they leave this monopoly that they effectively have in their regional environment. And they've now got to go create really amazing experiences. And it's hard for them. The second thing is running an operating company is really hard. Yes. It's really hard. Okay. Yeah. You know, running a TikTok, you know, video is easy. Running an operating company with people and customers and staffing and locations and insurance and legal and regular, I mean, all of these things are incredibly complicated. And then the biggest thing, this has been studied over the years, some of the best and most successful unicorns, you can have great leadership, great education, great products, great everything, great funding. You can have all those things aligned and you still could screw up in a business. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be timing and luck has to be in there. So you make a great point, which I agree with, which is you've got to basically not only be highly educated, have an amazing infrastructure in place like you have, but you've got to have tenacity and grind. And you yeah. said something, it takes two to three years. Yeah. And so you're really looking for the people that want to be the best. And that's really what you're kind of after. And really with that kind of tenacity to come in and, and, and do great things. Yeah, the way I look at it, Scott, it's like a bell-shaped curve. At one end of the, of the curve, you have people who come in and there's just no way they're ever going to make it. They don't have the maybe the hand-eye coordination. Maybe their hands are shaky. Maybe they just don't have the ability to sort of see. They just don't, for whatever reason, they're too old, they're too this or too that. They just, they just say, you know what, this isn't for me. Or we tell them, you know what, I just don't think this is for you. And just being kind about it because we don't want them to waste their time. At the other end of the curve, that other maybe 10%, are the people who really say, you know what? I love this. I wanted to do this my whole life. And they just jump in and they start swimming as fast as they can. They quit their day job. They, you know, bar the doors and windows. They start, you know, learning as much as they can. They take every course. In the middle, that middle 70, 80% are the people who sort of like want to do it, but they don't want to quit their day job. They're, they're maybe getting the benefits for their family. They've got some kids. They have a new house. They're, they, they don't have, so they still, keep their feet in the in the hospital environment although they hate it and they do this like part-time with friends and family on weekends this and that and that's the group that has the biggest struggle because honestly you can never make it until you pull the cord from the hospital i mean just honestly you just can't you got to be in this full time and then it's even really hard but that middle group is the group we really focus most of our energy on because we're like we can get some of those people to move to the right of the curve, you know, and become these ninja nurses, but they have to believe in themselves. They have to believe in us. And they have to take that step off the curb and get, get into the street and start moving. So that's kind of what happens. And again, most of the people who don't do that fail. So I would say like of a hundred people who come in, you know, maybe you're looking at 10 people who really have some pretty strong potential. And of that 10, maybe two or three become what I call ninja nurses who are completely independent. They vote for two or three bed spas. They're financially independent. They're the breadwinners for the family. You know, really serious nurses who 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 go for it. We've got a few of those in our network, and it's it's really exciting for us to be part of that and to be helping them through. So you, you you've mentioned that uh, you know kind of in the Northeast. If you're in California, is are these things you can participate in? Yeah, I mean, I think our model is going to be one that that's a national model because you know, for example, the whole compliance issue. I mean, it's the same issue in all 50 states in that a nurse cannot perform any medical procedure without an order from a duly authorized prescriber. In Massachusetts, that's an MD or an NP. In Connecticut, it's an MD, NP, or a PA. Every state's a little different, but that basic paradigm is the same. You know, a nurse has to have an order. And it has to be real time and patient specific, date specific, time specific, route specific, drugs. You know, it has to be like you're standing there. And very, very few people that I've talked to have have the ability to do that. And most of these issues are doing it illegally, as you pointed out earlier. So we have a solution to this problem. But people, you know, I guess people are figuring like, well, until I get caught, I can do it. But unfortunately, if you get caught, if you have a complication with a patient and you don't have an order for that patient and you've just done this without, well, you lose your license immediately. 
you you're it's negligence per se you go right to damages and the doctor who's quote unquote involved with you is, is guilty of inefficient you know insufficient uh oversight and they're in trouble too so like there's no reason to gamble with your license and your life for something that's simple to obtain if you just you know do it the right way so you know it's it's slow to be absorbed but unfortunately it has to be done that way otherwise you're putting everything you have at risk so let, let me just you know because you're, you're gonna have a national audience and some extent a global audience to this kind of med tech marketplace people watch this all over the place but primarily it's concentrated in the u.s so let's go back to this nurse practitioner mppa physician that's in california for whatever reason they're looking to yeah. expand their skills really they're coming to you both online and in person to really get advanced education on top of their existing license so yeah basically get information that allows them to go back to their community and make sure that they're operating legally and safely. And now they have a different level of education and they can keep going back to your program and continue to get education and knowledge to keep advancing their skills. So basically you're like, a, they're already graduated. They already have a driver's license. Now yeah. what you're really doing is teaching them how to be the best in their region. Um, or the best in their their particular discipline that they want to focus on. I mean, it really doesn't matter where they are in the U.S. They can be anywhere right. because they're already right. degreed, and it really isn't a function of licensure. They already have a license, right? And then they're either practicing without guidance or oversight, or they're going to go back and hey, you know what? I need to do this, and they're going to go find it. Yeah, I mean, they're licensed as nurses, but they have no training in aesthetics. They're licensed as a nurse practitioner, but they have little or no training in aesthetics. And certainly, there's no like formal certification. Oh, you are now an aesthetic nurse practitioner, which is what I'm trying to build. Like I'm trying to say, well, there there should be a degree program. There should be, you know, every like if you go to nursing school anywhere in the United States, the curriculum is pretty much the same. Like it's the same amount of learning. The exams are the same. Like the techniques are the same, the intramuscular, I mean, everyone learns kind of the same thing. Same thing with medical school, right? The basic sciences never change. But what does change is when you graduate medical school, you're an MD, but you can't do anything. You have to do a surgical you know, re residency or internal medicine residency or nephrology residency. Or, you know, you have to go to get additional training and that has very rigorous standards as well. Here in nursing, it's like, you're a nurse, see you later, figure it out. You know, there's no other training program to go into. So if you, like your nurse said, I'm doing this just to be, go into aesthetics. Well, she finished nursing school, but she knows nothing about aesthetics. Got it. This takes, this will take her from A to Z if she wants to do that and train her as much as she wants to from the very, very beginning to the end. So let's, let's do this. Let's cover some, I didn't intend on doing this. I'm actually interested because as you know, we, we have literally hundreds of new customers coming into this space. They are business people, they're family members, they're nurses, they're doctors. And like, you know what, I have had it with third-party reimbursement. I've had yeah. it with yeah. whatever, or I see an opportunity, I wanna do this. And literally we're sitting here going, well, we're not those guys. You know, we're, we're, we're here to provide you a great ex you know, customer or equipment experience and ultimately farm and other things that we're doing. So I'm gonna call and say, okay, you're gonna really need to go get some education. How does somebody get in touch with your group and Give us an idea of kind of the process to get onboarded and some of the costs yeah. associated, even though this isn't an infomercial, I'm sure, genuinely sure. intrigued because when yeah. people call me, I'm like, I really can't help you. You're going to have to go, just like you said, you're going to have to go figure it out. And then yeah. when you're ready, call me. And what I usually say to them, Dr. Russo, is don't buy any equipment because yeah, you're right. That is not the first thing you should be doing. It's literally the last thing you should be doing. And maybe you should even do it at all. But don't think for a minute the equipment's going to be your panacea and get to the get to the the end zone. So, what are the steps to get connected to you, and what are some of the yeah. costs associated with it? Sure. So, if you just Google us at the Aesthetic Mentor, right? Theaestheticmentor.com. We are our our site in Waltham in Connecticut will come up, and you'll see like um, that we have student advisors, just like in in college in high school you have advisors, uh, guidance counselors. We have student advisors, so you would get on and you would call either Lou or Sigourney. And they would say, hey, Scott, I'm Sigourney, you know, what are you interested in? Have you done this before? Okay, let me just take you through our curriculum. The first thing you've got to do is take Introduction to Neurotoxin. All our courses are CME accredited. So you get CME credits, which nurses need anyway, every year to maintain their certification. So you take this, this course and you, you, you would buy it for X amount of money. You would do the online video that Dr. Russo has done. It's a four hour thing. And in that video, there are, court, there are questions that are little exams. If you pass that question, you get to the go to the next section. If you don't, 
takes you back to the section where the answer was. You get to the end of that. Oh, okay, I've completed that. Then you're qualified to come in to do the hands-on. So you would come to either location and you would get a little review when you come in for about an hour, hour and a half by one of our other doctors. And they would highlight all the points that Dr. Russo really, you know, wants you to really understand. Then you start injecting patients. That's day one. And you'd inject probably three to five patients that day. And then if you stick around for day two, there's another quick sort of wrap up some new ideas, some ideas about assessing patients. Then you spend the rest of the day injecting patients again. We call those models in, as I mentioned, from our list of 5,000 in our model lab, and you inject until your hands fall off. And so like that would be step one. And then they would say, okay, after that, you would do this. After that, you would do this. And like if you, like we did for the first time last week in Connecticut, a four-day course where we did two days of the neurotox and two days of the filler. So they get a tremendous discount for that. If they do the neurotox and the filler together, they get a discount. If they do neurotox and filler and cadaver, they get an even bigger discount because we want people to buy in. Like we want people to say, look, I really want to do this. And if you really want to do it, buy these courses, move forward. And then, you know, then you can take the advanced courses and the ultra advanced courses and all this sort of stuff. But we have someone to guide you. We have someone to guide you through it. And I will tell you, oh, the other thing that separates us from everybody else is in most of these courses, you have one person, usually a nurse, training, you know, 10 to 15 other people in one room. In our courses, our ratio is one instructor for every two students. So you're never injecting someone without this instructor standing right next to you. And the other student who isn't injecting is participating in the assessment, is, is recording everything, making sure everything is properly documented. So you're always involved. You will never, at least I have never seen a school that comes anywhere close to that. In fact, and if someone says, hey, Scott, I think you need a little extra help, we're going to go one-on-one with you today to really get you up to speed. I mean, we have the ability to do that too. So, so that's unheard of in the industry, Scott. And thanks to our relationships with some of the bigger you know, producers of product, we can provide an unlimited amount of product to our, to our treatment for our, for our patients and our models so that we, it's not an issue. So for the price we're charging, it is like an incredible value because it will really make you an ejector. You know, super, really incredible phone call, or really incredible discussion. And I've learned so much. And Dr. Ruzzo, it's been absolutely a pleasure to, to get to know you better, to learn about your passion and uh, commitment to, to changing the industry and uh, what you and your group are, uh, have set out to do. And, you know, this industry is expanding, as we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, at such a rapid rate. Regulatory is going to be decades behind it. And it's people like you that are getting ahead of this and taking their decades of experience and really focused on the, you know, the clinical outcomes and the safety that are really going to make this industry become probably one of the greatest industries in healthcare that I believe. And we're going to have the greatest 20 years. The next two decades are going to be remarkable in aesthetics. And really, I know this is a bit of a stretch, but it's really going to be that kind of that next leap to living a very, very long time, potentially yeah. even longer than a long time. This next 20 years is going to be really, really pivotal in, in making that connection. So super grateful for you taking an hour out of your day and, and helping everyone kind of understand what your mission is, your team's mission and, and where you're headed. And I'm super grateful for the opportunity to talk to you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to sort of get some of this information out there because I just feel so passionate about it because it's so important to be trained well and to, you know, really not hurt patients and not, you know, lose your reputation. And that's what we're really all about, just becoming the gold standard in education and helping all of you become successful. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Russo. Appreciate having you on.